a slightly alternate version of the partly the curiosity, partly a sense of adventure, but mostly it's for the fame and money line, is reworked into Zaphod talking about the nano situation. What were you doing visiting Earth, Zaphod? Why were you headed for Ireland? Well, it was partly the curiosity, partly a sense of adventure, but mostly it was the money. Money? Money in mind-mangling amounts. That was close! Will somebody do something? In The Restaurant at the End of the Universe novel, Douglas Adams wrote lyrics for two songs about teleportation. Dirk Maggs previously got Philip Pope to put the lyrics to music for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy radio show live, creating the song The Teleportation Blues. For the hexagonal phase, they worked the song into the plot. And to add another thing, Zaphod's second head is detached from him, being renamed Left Brain. In the hexagonal phase, Left Brain explains he was detached due to a teleporter malfunction. He then sings the teleportation blues in order to explain the situation to the rest of the cast. Mitchman plays Left Brain and performs the song. I have another brain we can use. We are so screwed. Where is your other head, Zaphod? In the control panel. Let's slide him out. I call him LB, Left Brain, because he was on the left and the brainy one. Yuck. He just floats in the jar. I'm resisting the temptation to ask if he's pickled. Hey, trillion baby, looking good. Hi, LB. Well, he's still got the charm. If maybe a touch more eyeliner? A forward thrusting backlit champion of the boudoir needs to look his best. What made you take him off, Zaphod? Not enough mirrors in the bathroom? It was a style thing. Our headgear choices were clashing. Buff a biscuit, Beeble Brox. It was a teleporter malfunction. Let me tell you all about it. Roll the track! Sock, I forgot. What? It's karaoke night. Alda Baron's great okay. Al Gal spread a need. A bit of Jorsa spread a girls will knock you off your feet. They'll do anything you like real fast and then real slow. But if you have to take me apart to get me there, then I don't. Since the hip action, impressive. Thanks, man. Excuse me, LB. The scene of Arthur meeting the Finchurch construct in Wowbagger's ship includes two separate bits of scrapped Hitchhiker's Guide material. Namely, a bit of him saying, If only you knew, if only you knew, to Wowbagger, and a bit about his appallingly dull life from the end of the Arthur's Nightmare section. Both of these bits were scrapped bits from Life, the Universe, and Everything, and were reworked into a conversation between Arthur and the Finchurch construct. Finchurch? No, I'm the ship's computer programmed to scan your memory to find and then emulate the voice you are most comfortable hearing. Oh, for a moment I... Yes? Nothing. I just hoped you were really... her. Uh... Sorry, I'm not. I don't actually know you at all, Arthur Dent. Ah, well, you have a lot to learn then. <laughs> oh, if only you knew. If only you knew. Knew what? That before you stands a space adventurer, time traveler, cave dweller, and converser with pan-dimensional mice. Mm, right. What I'm looking at is a human male past his prime who will go pretty much unnoticed if it wasn't for the matted beard and tatty dressing gown. 
Oh. Oh? All my memories have dropped back into place with a sort of dull thud. Like when I was a child, the excitingly large Christmas parcels which would arrive in late November and on December 25th turned out to contain handkerchiefs and socks. I have led an appallingly dull life. Perhaps you led an exciting life, but just looked appallingly dull. <sighs> Perhaps the best that can be said is that I left the universe the way I found it. And even that's an overstatement. <sighs> Please enter the body optimizer cubicle and tell me what you want. The section on the government of Urgle Falls Sandwich Haven, from a scrapped opening chapter of Life, the Universe, and Everything, was reworked into one of John Lloyd's guide entries. On the planet Urgle Falls Sandwich Haven, a new government has just been elected by a narrow majority of voters who prefer to believe any old fib printed in a lurid headline over mere facts. The new government is pledged to oppose, rout, and undo utterly all that the previous government set out to do. This involves moving the entire population of the planet back out of the sea, cutting off their fins and learning about bricks again, while the mineral-rich seabed is ruthlessly plundered for private profit. But democracy is more important than a bunch of gangsters in power to the Urgelfall sandwich havens. They just keep their fins somewhere they know they can find them after the next election. This relaxed approach to adversity is not shared by Zaphod Beeblebrox, who arrives on Asgard's Rainbow Bridge after a close encounter with the vacuum of space. Oh. The original scrap section on Wowbagger from Life, the Universe, and Everything, where he stole an immortality stone and was on the run, was reworked into a guide entry about an ancestor of Wowbagger named Wowbagger Ultrajax. Wowbagger the Infinitely Prolonged is not the first of his line to be afflicted by immortality, nor the first to wish it had not been thrust upon him. His ancestor, Wowbagger Ultrajax, had at some point early in his eventful life stolen the great quenchless stone of Firefrand from the majestic Vantrachel of Lob. So far from being thereby enabled to lead a life of shameless luxury and hedonism as he had hoped, he'd been forced to spend the greater part of his time fleeing the Silastic armor fiends of Stritorax as they pursued him from world to world. When the Silastic armor fiends flagged in the chase, their places were taken by the strenuous gar fighters of Stug. And when they had had enough, the strangulous Stiletons of Haglavinda pursued Wabagger back again until he began seriously to regret that he had ever stolen the wretched stone in the first place. His vexation was increased by the fact that the power for which the Quenchless Stone was famous was that of bestowing eternal life on its owner. And it was beginning to look as if he had an awful lot more of this aggravating lifestyle to look forward to. He could simply get rid of the stone, but being now something over 300,000 million years old, he couldn't help feeling that it would be an awful waste of time if he were just to give up now. Added to which, he would of course simply drop down dead if he lost the stone, and he regarded this as a constant and annoying temptation rather than an acceptable solution. The fate of Wowbagger Ultrajax is as yet unknown. For all we know, he's still on the run. His many times great-grandson, sitting on the bridge of his ship, shares the curse of everlasting life, albeit thanks to a particle accelerator and a pair of rubber bands. Ford's prior history with the Citrica Galumbits was further expanded upon in an early version of the chapter about Wowbagger in Life, the Universe, and Everything, which was, of course, scrapped. It was reworked into the hexagonal phase by having the construct in Wabagger's ship briefly turn into Eccentrica Galumbits, before switching back to Fenchurch. Ford then reveals his history with the Centrica to Arthur. In that case, I have an idea. Call it up. Computer? You called Arthur? Computer? Yes, Ford, darling. My god, what is that? Wow! Eccentrica Columbits. Shall I slip into something less formal? No! Please! Can we please have Fenchurch back? Of course. I was trying to be polite. Constructing a familiar presence from Ford's memories. Ooh, that was close. There are memories best left alone. Yes, I see what you mean. Oh, I don't know. She looked like a bit of a character. Arthur, I can't put this with much more delicacy and coherence than you might comfortably squeeze onto the slide plate of an electron microscope, but I'll try. 
The number of people who have survived an entire night with Eccentrica, whose erogenous zones, I should add, start some four miles from our actual body, and whose embraces have been likened to an earthquake in a snake pit, is zero. But you did it, presumably? I managed 30 minutes, then I called a cab. Now, computer. You the next section has an interesting history. One of the issues with adapting in another thing into a radio phase was that Arthur and Ford had little to do in the original book. To fix this, Dirk looked into a bunch of unused Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy bits, and he found that in the original manuscript to Life, the Universe, and Everything, there was a section on prehistoric Earth, centered on the character called the Consultant, a man in a black suit who sat on a horse. Dirk was able to rework this section into the hexagonal phase by Ford getting the idea to use the ship's construct feature to make a construct of their memories, memories they can't fully remember since they're so deep in their subconscious. So, Arthur and Ford end up on a construct of prehistoric Earth, where they meet the Consultant, and the scene plays out like it did in the Scrap chapter. By total coincidence, the Consultant scene ends with him screaming about how there's no god, and if there is, it should strike him down where he stood, before getting struck by lightning. Both Thor and the concept of gods is a huge plot element of And Another Thing. You're aware that the guide Mark II manipulated our minds to place us in a virtual form of time and space? Yes. Can you do the same thing? Mm, not exactly. I don't have unfiltered perception, but I can create a construct which will seem real and will interact with you. But won't it just serve up stuff we know already? It has a pan-dimensional aspect. This ship was Thor's, so the computer is touched by godly magic. Well, in that case, look into my memory, beyond my conscious recall, and see if you can find someone from whom we could get some answers, both Arthur and myself at the same time. Mmm. There is a lot beyond your conscious recall. You have spent an awful lot of time smashed out of your skull. Exactly. So, you can send us somewhere we can find some answers. Looks like I can send you into your past, yes. Just when I was hoping there might be a cup of tea in my future. Later, Arthur. Computer, do it. Sit comfortably then. Ready? Ready. Ready?